That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Venus, named after the Roman goddess who represented love, beauty, desire, sex, fertility, prosperity and victory, claimed by Julius Caesar as one of his ancestors, is the second rock from the sun. Other than the moon, Venus is the brightest object in the night sky, its thick atmosphere reflecting lots of light from the sun. A body's reflective level is known as its albedo and Venus's is high. Venus orbits the Sun 31,068,560 miles or 50 million kilometres further out than Mercury. Known as both the morning star and the evening star, as it can be viewed at both of these times, it can even be viewed from Earth with the unaided eye in daylight. As I mentioned in the previous episode, Mercury, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, often referred to as the hell planet. So in this episode I will quickly explain why this is and it's really quite simple. Venus is wrapped in a thick atmosphere, much thicker than our own atmosphere here on Earth, composed predominantly of carbon dioxide. There is a wisp around three and a half percent of molecular nitrogen and trace elements of other gases including carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, water vapour, argon and helium. You will no doubt have heard the phrases global warming and greenhouse effects associated with the earth. Well, Venus's atmosphere is global warming on the rampage. You see, the heat of the sun can get in, but due to the planet's thick atmosphere, it struggles to get back out again. Infrared radiation gets stopped dead in its tracks by the greenhouse gases. Be warned, Earthlings. And so, Venus temperatures soar to around 480 degrees Celsius or 890 degrees Fahrenheit, which busts all records when it comes to the planet with the highest temperature, with Mercury coming in a close second to the Roman goddess's furnace-like environment. The temperatures are pretty much equal all around the globe that is Venus whether on the side facing the sun or the side facing away from it. Size-wise, Venus is only around 5% smaller than the Earth, with a diameter of around 7,520 miles, or 12,104 kilometres, compared to our planet's diameter of 7,926 miles, or 12,756 kilometres. What we should note here is the diameter of most planets is wider across their equator than it is from pole to pole, due to the speed most planets rotate at, which creates a bulge around their waist. Now, Venus, like Mercury, rotates very slowly, once every 243 Earth days. But Venus does it differently. Venus actually rotates backwards, or what we call retrograde. Only one other planet does this, and that is the gas forward slash ice giant Uranus over in the outer solar system. What this means for Venus is that the sun actually rises in the west and sets in the east. Now, not only is Venus a similar size to Earth, its core is also believed to be the same size, roughly as our planet's core. It has been measured but how is probably a bit deep for this current series of videos. We may address the techniques used to measure certain things out there in space in a separate series in the future. There is strong reason to believe there was once a fair amount of water on Venus. One of the main indicators is the presence of a large amount of deuterium in the atmosphere of the planet. Now most of us understand that water is made up of two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. That's fairly straightforward. But there is a twist. Hydrogen isotopes come in two different, what we call, flavours. One being known as deuterium. What this means is standard baseline hydrogen contains a proton and a nucleus. But deuterium contains a proton and a neutron and a nucleus which means it weighs twice that of normal hydrogen. 
Now, when water evaporates on a planet, the hydrogen element begins to leak out of the atmosphere and on into space, but the deuterium, being heavier, is left behind. Deuterium, for good reason, is also known as heavy hydrogen and sometimes heavy water. So we know water contains roughly 156 deuterium atoms for every 1 million hydrogen atoms. So from that ratio, taking into account the levels of deuterium in the atmosphere of Venus, we can calculate how much water has been lost roughly over billions of years. And it's a significant amount with Venus. This is what we call indirect evidence as so far we have been unable to study the surface enough to witness the same marks created by flows of water that we see from footage provided by satellites orbiting Mars. The thick clouds in Venus atmosphere have made this option almost impossible for now. Let's take a look at exploration of Venus. In 1610, Galileo observed with his telescope that Venus actually showed phases and so proved that it orbits the Sun and not the Earth, as predicted by Copernicus's heliocentric model and also disproving Ptolemy's geocentric model. If you didn't know, heliocentric describes the planets orbiting the Sun. Geocentric was the belief that everything out there orbited the Earth, which we now know not to be the case. It is my understanding that 50 different spacecraft, including American, Russian, European Space Agency, or ESA, and the Japanese, JAXA, have all attempted flybys, orbits, or landers on or around Venus since Galileo turned his telescope to the second rock from the sun. Some made it, most failed miserably, but with space exploration, failure is all part of the learning process. If we don't fail, we don't improve. The full list of missions with launch dates, I will add to the comments section below this video on YouTube. On the 12th of February, 1961, the Soviet Union launched Venera 1, on a flyby mission. After a relatively successful pass in 1962, all contact was lost. No telemetry data was received back here on Earth after a complete failure of its systems. On the 12th of November, 1965, Venera 2 went the same way as Venera 1. And on the 16th of November, 1965, four days after the launch of Venera 2, Venera 3 set off on a mission to land on the planet. Unfortunately, all contact was lost as it entered the thick atmosphere, and so Venera 3 became the first spacecraft to crash onto another planet's surface. On the 12th of June 1967, Venera 4 launched, and in the following October, it entered the atmosphere of Venus, returning data, which revealed that the atmosphere was predominantly carbon dioxide with a pressure of 22 standard atmospheres. Venera 4 also sent the first images of below the cloud cover, but then its systems failed, with all contact lost. It impacted with the surface. From there, after a few probes were sent, a few more fails and a few flybys, one by NASA's Mariner 5 in 1967. Venera 7 landed on Venus in 1970, even though its parachute had failed. It successfully sent back temperature data for 23 minutes before it died. In 1975, Venera 9 orbiter and lander successfully touched down and became the first spacecraft to deploy its camera on the surface of another planet and send back images. In 1981, Venera 13 landed and worked away on the planet for just over two hours, discovering that at the surface there was a pressure of 89 atmospheres, which basically means you would literally become a splodge of goo on the floor, assuming you could somehow manage to go there and avoid the heat. Venera 13 then sent back the first colour images of the planet. Its onboard spectrometer tested soil samples 
and its microphones recorded the first ever sounds from another planet, the wind. On the 4th of May 1989, NASA launched Magellan, or as some people say, Magellan, to orbit Venus and provide a topographical map of the planet, which took it four years to complete. Galileo, which we will discuss when Your Place in the Cosmos looks at Jupiter, and Cassini, which we will also discuss when we take a look at Saturn in a later episode, have both since undertaken flybys on their journeys to their respective gas giants, as I have just mentioned. Messenger, which we talked about in our previous episode, Mercury, also had two successful flybys in 2005. On the 9th of November 2005, the ESA, European Space Agency, launched its Venus orbiter. On the 20th of May 2010, JAXA's Akatsuki launched attempts to orbit Venus. Now, look into the future, we have the following missions planned. Da Vinci, a NASA flyby and delivery of an atmospheric probe to the surface of Venus, is penned in for a June 2029 launch. Veritas, NASA's Venus orbiter, is penned in for 2031. And Envision, an ESA Venus orbiter, is penned in for 2032. Next episode, we look at planet Earth, the blue marble or the pale blue dot, as the legend Carl Sagan christened it. Currently, over 7 billion of us call it home. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man.